Think of it, gentlemen. Hoof and mouth disease, a thing of the past. Never mind that shit. Here comes Flat Earth Society. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Sheriff! Flat Earth Society. He's... Sheriff! Flat Earth Society. He's back. He's breaking up the whole town. You've got to help us, please. Did you hear that? Now it's please. So where is the edge? Who's to say that there is an edge, and why assume there is one? Is it because when we are introduced to the idea of a flat earth, it's always depicted like this? Asking if a flat earth has an edge is not an inappropriate thing to ask given that Flat Earthers have given zero evidence as to what the rest of space looks like in a Flat Earth model, or even presented a model. There is no coherent theory about the Flat Earth to go to. The entire movement is 100% speculation. In the currently most accepted model, Antarctica is not a continent, but a 360 degree land mass made up of ice that holds the oceans within. When we look at a Gleason's map, from 1892 that states at the top that it's scientifically and practically correct, as is. I don't think it means what you think it means. We see this Antarctic ice rim. The Gleason's map is basically an azimuthal equidistant projection which can be traced back to the year 1000. The AE map is also an official map of the United States Geological Survey, the USGS, and the official logo for the United Nations. All of what he just said is true. The azimuthal equidistant maps are used by the USGS, and it is the symbol for the UN. Sadly, this is where he stops being reasonable and correct. Oh, it's funny cuz it's true. The oldest known globe in the world is from 1492. Interesting you should say that, since the Greeks had globes as early as the first century BCE. They of course would have globes back then because Pythagoras had proved the Earth was round 500 years before that. The Martin Beheim globe is simply the oldest surviving globe. Funny how the Beheim globe does not include your beloved Antarctica. This is something you need to keep in mind because many people argue that the azimuthal equidistant map is just a flattened out version of the globe, when in fact the globe is just a rounded version of this true world flat map. If the flat map came first and it has the ability to convert into a globe without any problems whatsoever, then that should tell you a little bit about how this globe deception was achieved. So his argument is that maps can be globes and globes can be maps. Therefore the earth is flat? The fuck do you think a map is? One-eyed willy. One-eyed willy. Uh, Alright, simple debunking here. These maps distort the further you get from the center. Does he really think Australia is larger than North America? If this was the one true map of the world, why wouldn't it have its sizes correct? That son of a bitch lied to us! I knew I should have voted for McCain! Now, back to if there is an edge or not. There is no proof that there is an edge past the Antarctic ice wall, but it is speculated by many that perhaps the plane that we live on is either extremely expansive or it's possibly endless. In these two scenarios, it would be logically assumed that more land is being hidden from the general public. In a 1954 interview with Admiral Richard E. Byrd, an American naval officer who specialized in exploration, he had this to say. 
But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. Implying that there is more land past Antarctica. Hundreds of people have crossed Antarctica since Admiral Byrd's interview in the 1950s. Sadly, they were all Catholic, Communist, Illuminati, Rothschild, Bilderberg, Freemason, Reptile Jews, so none of what they say or documented can truly be trusted. Perhaps one of these flat do earthers it! should put their money with their mouth Just in. Just do it! Enjoy an expedition across the Antarctic to find the edge or not edge. Yesterday, Go on, you said click tomorrow. the link. So I've just done half your work do for it. you. Make your dreams come true. If that uninhabited land was on a globe, it would be in the Indian Ocean. A recent discovery of an old Buddhist map in a newspaper from 1907 seems to support the idea of a vast plain with much more land. Where does the sun go if the earth is flat? Well, the sun neither rises nor sets, but travels in a clockwise circuit from east to west and only appears to rise and set due to perspective. The sun disappears at the vanishing point of human perspective on the horizon where the ground meets the sky. And since the sun is not 93 million miles away, I repeat, not 93 million miles away, but much closer and smaller, the light emanating from the sun only illuminates about half of the flat plane at once as it makes its daily journey. I'm going to let be the complete lack of mechanics and the ad hoc nature of this model. That would be taking the easy road. Instead, I will delve into an obvious problem with this model. It does not allow for seasons, just day and night cycles. Lucky for us, another intrepid flat earther has attempted to solve this very problem. Sadly, this model doesn't really work either. Going into the many myriad of issues with this model is not really the scope or purpose of this video. If you're really interested in what's wrong with this, you can message me, I guess. An example of a problem with this model would be... Hmm, how the sun illuminates the northern hemisphere summer. High summer noon in New York would see the same amount of sunlight 6,000 miles north into, say, Mongolia and 6,000 mile, 6, miles south into Argentina. In essence, a winter day in Argentina would receive the exact same sunlight as a summer night in Mongolia. I hope I don't have to explain that this doesn't actually happen. What's underneath the flat earth? This is obviously an unanswerable question. No, it's not. Since the assumed edge has never been known to be reached. But many people suppose that whether the earth is round or flat, that either way, it still must be floating in the middle of outer space. But the idea of outer space goes out the window with the round earth theory. Many religious texts support an immovable earth that has its foundations on which it is laid and its pillars by which it is supported. We simply don't know, but we do know that the earth is obviously fixed in place as we can tell by our everyday experience of non-movement. God, I hope he never rides a train or airplane or boat or car or bus or monorail. His mind might literally blow up. What we see in the skies above are illuminated objects making circles around us just as it appears. Whatever this place may be, it's the center of all we survey. Some say that the earth is the floor of the universe. In the ancient Hebrew conception of the universe, we are surrounded by the waters above and the waters below, known as the Great Deep. 
The deepest hole ever drilled into the earth was a total of about seven and a half miles. The very core of the earth is nothing more than wild speculation, if not another malicious lie. I'm not going to go into detail about seismology and the earth's interior here, as that is not the purpose of this particular video. Instead, I will link below a talk on the subject. That way you can see the math itself and how it works. I would again like to point out how the author of the video doesn't provide any justification or facts to support his claim. And when he states his word as undeniable truth, a trait far too common among pseudoscience believers. So what's under the earth? That remains a mystery to us all. But another thing that you can research is what's inside the earth. Multi-billion dollar deep underground military bases known as DUMBs. D-U-M-Bs, right? What about ships and boats disappearing over the horizon? This is also due to human perspective. They don't go over the horizon, they go into the horizon, moving beyond the limit of our vision and past the vanishing point. But the ships and boats are easily brought back into view with a pair of binoculars, a telescope, and any camera with a good zoom lens. Notice again the complete lack of data. With no way to know how far out the boats are, we cannot know if we should be seeing them dip under the horizon, or by how much. This is the difference between science and pseudoscience. A great question to ask yourself is why can't we see noticeable curvature from 120,000 feet up? But many people claim that the supposed curvature can be seen from the ground by watching boats. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense is not an argument. With a wider view angle, you can see the curvature of the Earth just fine. God, I feel like I'm repeating myself here. Where are your numbers? Where is your analysis? Where are the equations showing that a curvature should be seen, but is not? Have you bothered trying to find pictures showing the curvature? Is your ignorance bubble just too comfortable? I am shocked! Shocked! Well, not that shocked. And what about all of the pictures of the Earth? They are all clearly computer-generated images. It's still real to me, damn it! <laughs> they claim this picture from Apollo 17 in 1972 is real, and they also claim that the 2015 epic Earth picture is real. But NASA employee Robert Simmon gave us a glimpse of how they do it when he shared his experience of creating the Blue Marble 2.0 in 2002. He is now called Mr. Blue Marble. He was interviewed and on record stating, the last time anyone took a photograph from above low Earth orbit that showed an entire hemisphere, one side of the globe, was in 1972 during Apollo 17. NASA's Earth Observing System, EOS, satellites were designed to give a checkup of Earth's health. By 2002, we finally had enough data to make a snapshot of the entire Earth, so we did. In 2002, Blue Marble 2.0, NASA's Rob Simmons made this. Simmons' job is... It's primarily taking data and making pictures out of it. That's what this is, a composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. So we actually had to take clouds out. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it was a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just take Command-Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. 
what I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. But I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is Photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is Photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is Photoshopped, but it's it has to be. It is Photoshopped, but it's it has to be. Another dumbass example of the author not knowing his ass from a hole in the ground. If he would have Googled untouched pictures of Earth, he would have found them. NASA's EPIC website puts a new one up every 12 hours or so. The difference is those pictures are murky and not very colorful. They are not very good as advertisement. The photoshopping Dr. Simmons did is used every day by people from many fields of study and it's called remote mapping. The process of remote mapping involves taking different wavelengths of data and combining them to produce the picture you want. You don't make fake data in remote mapping, just alter it to get the best picture possible. If I photo touch a picture of my wife, does that prove my wife no longer exists? Why are all the other planets round then? When you compare amateur footage done with professional grade cameras and compare it to NASA's official images of planets and stars, it's clear that NASA images are all computer generated, no different than the photos of Earth. Okay, to catch you all up, I cannot get NASA quality photos of Jupiter with my shitty Walmart telescope. Therefore, the Earth is flat. That is his entire argument. You, sir, are an idiot. What have become known as planets are round lights that seem to be set over the flat Earth. The so-called planets and stars are not what we have been told they are. Oh, by the way, just believe him. He doesn't need to provide any evidence because. Girl, you know it makes sense. And comparing luminous objects that you see in the sky to the earth under your feet is very ineffective for actually proving the supposed rotundity of the earth. Since there are no actual photographs of the earth and motion has never been experienced or proven, it would seem more logical for one to assume that we are on a flat motionless plane and everything we see in the heavens revolves around us. No, you are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. What about satellites and GPS? Wait, 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 wait. Let me guess. Satellites are fake. As crazy as it may sound, satellites are a hoax. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why there are never any damaged or fallen satellites? And why there are no satellite malfunctions due to constant heating and cooling? It's weird they don't melt in the thermosphere that's over 2000 degrees. Satellites have fallen from orbit and do need to be repaired from time to time. If only the author had access to some cheap, efficient way to look up information. Some engine that could search for him. I find myself looking at the moon and wondering why we never see satellites pass by the moon. Did you know there are thousands of miles of fiber optic cables under the seabed that supplies 90% of the Earth's communication? 
internet, phones, etc. And GPS works off of cell phone towers. It's called triangulation. Haven't you seen those really tall towers and wondered what they are? Isn't it funny how GPS existed before cell phones? It's not true! That's impossible! Satellite TV is just enhanced radio using ground-based towers. It's all ground-based, just like the old TV antenna. Science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke proposed the idea of geostationary satellites in 1945 in a magazine called Wireless World. And 20 years later, in 1965, they claim to have successfully launched the first commercial geostationary communication satellite. Today, there are said to be thousands, but the odd thing is that trying to prove it only leaves you fruitless.